Between 1954 and 1975, about 30,000 Newfoundlanders and Labradorians left their outport homes and moved into larger towns and settlements, known as growth centers. They did this under government-run resettlement programs. In just two decades, more than 250 villages disappeared. Some had been around for centuries. When Newfoundland and Labrador joined Canada in 1949, it had about 1,200 communities. Most were small, with fewer than 300 residents, and almost all were scattered across the extensive coastline. They were oriented towards the sea and designed to give residents easy access to the fishing grounds. But they were also isolated and hard to reach. Roads didn't link all of the settlements together. Some were accessible only by ship. Almost all of these settlements had developed around the traditional salt cod fisheries. It was a family-based industry. Generally speaking, the men fished from small open boats and the women and children processed the catch on land. The fish was dried, salted, and sold to markets in Europe and the Caribbean. The industry had sustained outport Newfoundland and Labrador for generations, but it was struggling by the 1950s. A new industrialized fishery was replacing it. Fishermen now worked aboard large offshore trawlers and their catch was processed inside company-owned fish plants. Instead of salt fish, workers produced fresh and frozen cod. It was sold in North American supermarkets. The family-based fishery and its salt cod could not compete. Nor was there a strong political will to sustain it. Joseph Smallwood's new provincial government wanted to diversify, industrialize, and modernize the Newfoundland and Labrador economy. The traditional fishery was out of step with this new vision. The government also wanted to raise standards of living. By North American standards, Newfoundland and Labrador was not a very modern society in 1949. Only about half of the population had electricity. Paved roads were rare, one-room schools were not uncommon, and many people still had to travel for hours to reach a hospital. Smallwood was determined to change that, but he knew that delivering services to hundreds of small and remote outports would cost a fortune. The government believed that larger communities were the solution, that they could offer residents more jobs and a higher quality of life. It devised a centralization program in 1954 to encourage rural families to move. It offered householders between $300 and $600 to relocate to a larger community of their choosing. But there was a catch. Every single household in a settlement had to agree to move before the money was paid. Over the next 11 years, 115 communities were abandoned and about 7,500 people were resettled. In 1965, the province joined with the federal government to create a new resettlement program. It offered more money, $1,000 per household plus $200 for every member. But instead of going to a community of their choosing, people now had to go to government-designated growth centers. Another change was that fewer people had to agree to move. 90% at the start of the program, and that dropped to 80% two years later. Resettlement was voluntary, but the fact that the vast majority of people had to agree before anyone could receive financial assistance became a source of conflict in some communities. If a minority of people didn't want to move, then they risked coming under considerable pressure from the majority of people who did want to move. Between 1965 and 1975, about 20,000 people resettled, and about 150 communities were abandoned. Among those were 16 in Labrador. One of the people who moved was Irene Brown. She left Tax Beach and settled in Arnold's Cove. I hope my memory served me correctly. It was 1966, and that was Newfoundland come home year. 
And so for me, that was very ironic because it was the year that I left home as such. But again, you know, there was a vote. And I, as I recall, it was about 80% had to agree. And a lot of people did seem to want to move. Uh, I guess um, for a lot of people, they thought, oh, well, we'll have a lot more things if we move away. And... Uh, and again, if you wanted, you know, to get to a hospital, you had to go down to come by chance. So that was the boat ride down. And because uh, I remember when my sister-in-law was uh, pregnant with her first child and there was some complication. I don't know what it was, but she had to get on the boat and go for an hour and a half to Arnold's Cove and then go by car down to come by chance hospital and had a safe delivery. But I think it was things like that, that a lot of people thought for medical reasons. And again, I guess maybe they thought was more opportunities. And also, a lot of young people were going to be leaving. Um, would the community have just eventually died? I don't know. But obviously, this hurried it up. Joey Smallwood had this thing about, he, I don't think he was a fan of fishing or a fisherman. And so he seemed in a rush to get everybody to, to move. Like a lot of the people who resettled, Brown's family floated their home to their new community. No other image is as closely tied to resettlement as that of a skiff or schooner towing a house across the water. My mother told me that uh, the day the word came, they're here to take the house, because she had one of the old ringer washers, you know, those old noisy ones, you know the one I mean? And she had just put clothes in the washer and word came, they're here to take the house. Was that sudden? You know, I guess they were taking houses all the time, but then suddenly it was her house that was going and she had a washer. Half a century later, resettlement remains a controversial, complex and emotionally charged topic. On one hand, there certainly were social and economic gains for moving. Easier access to schools and health care, indoor plumbing, electricity, and waged employment, but only if you could get it. There were also problems with resettlement. The government's promise of more and better job opportunities in the growth centers was not always realized. For many people, resettlement led to unemployment and welfare. Some people even began to commute to their old communities and their old fishing grounds. Well, Dad definitely did not want to move because his livelihood was up there. And uh, again, being 50 years old, uh, that was the life he had chosen. Dad went back to Tax Beach to lobster fish every spring. It's, it's really not an all or nothing kind of thing because Again, if somebody was leaving who had a job that they were going to, but somebody else didn't, and then depending on the age, and like in my father's case, he'd have to go back to fish or go on welfare or something, and I think that would have killed him if he'd had to do that. I don't think he would have been able to handle that. So it was back to do the, to fish. I, never, I don't ever recall mom regretting her move she seemed to settle in quite well. Resettlement also resulted in cultural losses. These are hard to measure, but enormously significant. As people abandoned their homes and their independent lifestyles in the outports, they also left behind a way of life that had endured for generations. Up in Tex Beach, we'd had a huge garden. And of course, now the house was on this smaller piece of land and it was all just mud and muck and in Tex Beach as well we had um, we had sheep so the sheep had this huge garden as well so uh, so again the, in terms of land it was greatly reduced and of course having to leave the sheep had to be slaughtered <laughs> they couldn't be taken away the theme of cultural loss was taken up by some artists in Newfoundland and Labrador Images of abandoned houses and graveyards, of churches falling apart, of people stealing one last glance at their vacant homes. All of these images conjure up impressions of a lost way of life. 
Change was likely hardest on the middle-aged and elderly residents, but it also left a powerful impression on the children and teenagers who moved. I don't know, maybe there's a sense of impermanency, I don't know, because uh, like up home, our, the church, the school, everything like that was demolished. Wherever I go, it becomes home almost immediately, <laughs> but not home at all, do you know what I mean? Uh, like you're a, like a rover or something, but that's up home. <laughs> that's up home, although I haven't been up there since 1992, and it's not the same at all, of course. <laughs>